I was looking for a joke on histograms and couldn't come up with much, but then I saw this cute cartoon, always label your axes. And that is very important when you are making histograms. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, histograms and OGIVs. All right. So we have a table here and um, we can actually use each of these frequencies to create a data display. Uh, the only one I won't be use, oh, I don't have midpoints, so we're good here. Um, the first one I'm going to focus on is just the plain old frequency, the number of items in each class. Well, what we're going to do when we create a histogram is first we're going to title the graph. We'll label both axes, remember the cartoon. Place your class boundaries on the horizontal axis and place your frequencies or relative frequencies on the vertical axis. Remember the bar that we have, they're going to touch on histograms. So bar graphs, believe it or not, bar graphs, the bars don't touch. But on histograms, the bars do touch because we're on a number line and we're trying to cover every possible value. So the bar stops at one boundary and uh, starts at one boundary and stops at the next one. In this example, I'm going to go ahead and just do the plain old histogram, and I'm going to give it a boring title, Histogram of Test Scores. Put frequency on the vertical axis and score on the horizontal axis. Um, I see that the maximum value is 10, and I have enough here that I can get a 10, 12. I have enough uh, marks here that I can get there in jumps at 2. So I put my numbers there so I can see the frequency. And then I label here the values for my class boundary. See, I started with the lowest boundary, then I put 59.5. I don't have to do it again, so one bar is going to start here and stop there, and then right here where it touches starts the next bar. And so I continue on until I cover the range. Now, my first bar, my frequency is 3, so I basically shade this area until I get up to roughly 3. If you're doing these by hand, you can totally eyeball it. That's fine, as long as it looks roughly the right shape. The next one has a frequency of 5, so it should go up to here. Uh, the next one has a frequency of 12, so it's going to reach all the way to this top bar. Uh, then we have a frequency of 9, which is going to be halfway between 8 and 10. And then a frequency of 8, so it should just touch that bar. And then a frequency of 2. And there's your histogram. Once you have that frequency table made, making a histogram is actually pretty darn easy. So let's go ahead and do a relative fre frequency histogram. I probably should have said relative frequency up here, but I'm going to take care of it with this vertical axis here. Then I have score. And I remember this, uh, here's the maximum value here is 30.8. So I'm going to go to 30. It wouldn't be bad if I put 40 there. Then I'm going to put my uh, horizontal axis uh, labels here, covering the range of scores. And the first one is 7.7. .7. Whoops. So that goes about three quarters of the way up to 10%. Then I have 12.8%, uh, 30.8%, 23.1%, 20.5, .1 .1 .1 and 5.1. You should notice that this histogram is very similar to the one we just made for just plain old frequencies. The only difference is the vertical scale. Since I'm looking at percentages now and all these values add up to 100%. Whereas the previous thing, we just actually had all of the frequencies, so it was the total count. Now, you're also expected to describe histograms, and we usually refer to their symmetry or the modality. And symmetry is how much both sides are the same when we fold the graph in half. And if, it, if it is not symmetric, it is usually skewed. Now, modality refers to the number of distinct peaks. It has one peak, it's called unimodal. Okay, so this is a very popular distribution shape right here. If you look at the symmetry, it definitely looks the same if I fold it in half and there's only one peak. So this distribution is mountain shape because it is symmetric and unimodal. So I'm still going to stay uh, with a single peak. So both of these still have a single peak, but what's different is the symmetry. Both of these are skewed. Now the question is, is this skewed left or right? Well, usually what we do is we look at the tail where the data kind of trails off to. It's like, it looks like you're almost pulling on that side. 
So if I was pulling on the data, it looks like I'm pulling from the left. So the distribution is skewed left because the tail goes to the left. On this one, the distribution is skewed to the right. Now, the real way to tell skew is if I were to actually average all these data points, I would look, first of all, where is half of the data points? What line splits my data points in half? And it might be around here somewhere, right? But my average is going to be a little bit skewed to the left because of these higher values, all right? Same thing here. The half of my data points probably stops around here somewhere. And, but my average is going to be a little bit higher. It's going to be to the right. And that's why we talk about skewed left and skewed right. Now, two other shapes you will encounter in uh, histograms. One is called a uniform or rectangular distribution because the frequencies are almost the same. A great example of this is if I was rolling die, which is more likely, rolling a 1 or a 6? Well, hopefully you answered they're equally likely. So that means that the probabilities for each of the uh, classes should be the same. If you see a distribution like this, it's called bimodal. And that's because there are two peaks. And this happens a lot when we have a combined two different populations. A popular example would be, say, the heights of both of all the bas basketball players in a school. Well, you would have a higher distribution for the males and then you'd have a peak for the females. And when you put them together, it gives you two peaks. All right, so last but not least is creating an OGIV. Um, and that shows the percentage of the data points that occur in that class and lower. It's, called, it's basically using the cumulative relative frequency. So we have pretty much the same steps. You're gonna title, label your axes, use the class boundaries like before, we're going to place the relative frequencies on the vertical axis like we did on the other graph. But here's where we change. We place a dot on 0% at the lower class boundary, and I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Then we're going to use at this upper boundary, I'm going to put 3. I'll put the dot at 3. and then, Well, actually 7.7% because we're doing cumulative. And then for at 69.5, I'm going to move, put a dot at 20.5 and 79.5, I'll do 51.3, all the way until I get up to 100%. So place a dot for the class frequency over the next class boundary. So for this class, I put it over that boundary. Connect the dots with segments, and you're pretty much done. So here we have a cumulative relative frequencies of test scores. And there's, I label my axes. And I'm pretty sure I labeled the bottom axes at the end here. That's okay. All right, put my dot at zero. Then remember 7.7. .7, so your graph is always going to start at zero. So there's the 7.7, 20.5, halfway would be about here. 74.4 is going to be about there. And then 94.9, that's almost to 100, and then 100%. Then connect them with segments. And there is your OGIV. And don't forget, label both your axes. You don't want to have you don't want to lose an axe and have it unlabeled.